Hi everyone, welcome to our 8 Anodes 2023 lecture series. I hope you guys are all doing really well and having a wonderful term break. And I hope you've had a wonderful term 2 of year 12 as well. So once again, a very warm welcome to everyone from all of us here at 8 Anodes. Um, let's get started today. We do have a, uh, we do have a fair bit to get through, so let's dive straight into it. Um, before I get started, of course, um, I'd just quickly like you to introduce. I'd quickly like to introduce you to um, the resources that we have to offer here today, um, and you know, our, our sort of our mission statement to help you achieve the very best that you can. So you'll find that we have lots of free resources available today that you can access at our website. Um, and they include study notes, so free study notes that are posted by your peers, by past tutors, um, and it's a really good way to you know, consolidate your notes and add on to them. We of course have our lectures um, going on this week, so please uh, try and uh, uh, yeah, try and come to and sign up for as many as that are relevant to you, and I'm sure you'll find them super helpful. Along with that, we have our discussion forum um, forums as well. Very, it's a very you know a wonderful space for everyone to um, sort of come together and discuss their HSC lives. Along with that, we've got videos, newsletters, ADA calculators that will come um, into use, I guess, later down the track for you this year, and also articles um, that you know discuss study strategies and tips and lots more that you can check out on our website. So go to adanodes.com in order to access that. Along with that, um, I will be talking about other resources that we offer um, in order to give you that extra bit of help, a uh, bit of help if you are looking, um, you know, if you want it, if you need it. And coming from someone who has utilized these resources, I found them so helpful. So we've got TutSmart, which is our own online tutoring facility um, run by year 12 elite grads. And um, along with that, we also have our study guides and Ed Unlimited, uh, which is like a Netflix for all our study guides. And like I said, having used these resources i can assure you that they are so so helpful so definitely check them out um if you are looking for that bit of extra help that extra push to help you this year um so and of course before i uh get into it i'd like to extend a special thank you to to our sponsors who have helped us organize these lectures, um, including La Trobe University, RMIT, Deakin, UTS, and Macquarie. So thank you to these guys um, for helping us organize these lectures free for you. Uh, so let's get started um, with today's content. Like I said, we do have plenty to get through. We will be, um, and I'll get to it in just one sec, um, we will be covering module six and seven today. So fair bit for us to sort of work through, but hopefully by the end of this lecture, you're feeling a lot more confident um, with, you know, with the topics and you feel like, and I hope you feel like you have a fundamental grasp on these ideas that you can hopefully build on later when you go through this content in class or when you, you know, go about consolidating your notes. So let's get started. Um, now, of course, before I begin, I'd like to introduce myself. So my name is Aditi and I graduated um, in 2021 as Ducks with an ATA of 95. So I've done, um, so I've got band sixes in English, advanced extension, biology and PDHPE. I've also done chemistry and um, maths three units. Along with that, I am currently in my second year of Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Advanced Studies Medical Science at the University of Sydney um, as a Delio Scholar. So I'm majoring in medical science and political economy. Uh, other than that, huge pot ahead, love reading. Um, that's my English side, love, love, love reading. Um, and if you have any questions about um, any of, obviously any subjects, any uh, university university related questions please feel free to ask and i'll be answering them as we go and so yeah feel free to ask of course as many questions as you like about the content that we're going through today um and you know in general about biology about hse i'm more than happy to answer anything 
so today's agenda like I said is for us to um, recap module 6 then um, we will go through module 7 so help you get a foundational knowledge for module 7 and then we'll discuss study tips and exam strategies now um, I just like to flag I guess um, as you're watching this lecture definitely take notes obviously it helps a lot with you know trying to stay attentive and again I know you know sometimes it can be so hard to sit uh, behind a screen for two hours and be focused the whole entire two hours not the easiest thing to do so definitely um, try to jot down things that stand out at you ask lots of different questions make and I'm always happy to go ahead and, you know, explain things in different ways. If one way didn't make sense, I'd definitely do that. So let's get started um, today by firstly revising our sort of big ideas from Module 6. So we won't go through, obviously, the whole Module 6, um, but we will be revising the big ideas and the key concepts so that we can then go on and spend a lot more time going through Module 7. <laughs> So, um, as you would hopefully by now be familiar with it, this is what the HSC syllabus for biology looks like. You are studying effectively four topics. Um, the first one is heredity, followed by genetic change, infectious diseases, and non-infectious disease and disorders. So, um, since generally most schools sort of stick in that order of module five to eight, um, I'm assuming that most of you have done module five and six and I'm now going to start seven or you know like that would probably be the, probably be the majority of us if you haven't if today is you know your first time having a go at both module six and seven in case the school has done five and eight just try to follow through the best you can please ask lots of questions and I'll try break everything down so that we um to those to those of you who have done it you are building on your knowledge and to those who haven't had yet uh, who haven't yet had a chance to do it um you can you know again start to build our foundational knowledge so you can take along with you into term two oh well term three for year 12 so let's get started um so we're starting off by firstly looking at module six. So the first dot point of module six is asking us to look at mut uh, mutagens. What are the different types of mutation uh, mutagens and what mutations do they cause? So oh, well, we look at what mutations they cause in the next slide, but that's sort of the first big point. What are mutagens? So a uh, mutagen is an op. Sorry gonna sneeze um okay <laughs> it's been happening all day i feel like i need to sneeze but and then i think about it and it just goes away so apologies for that but um as i was saying so a mutagen is an organism that causes mutations um a mutagen can also be known as a mutant so there are three types of mutagens that we're looking at including chemical electromagnetic and naturally occurring so chemical mutagens include radioactive agents like uranium um, other chemicals and it causes structural changes we've got metals that including arsenic and nickel that can affect the dna replication process and finally we've got intercalating agents like um ethidium bromide which can cause frame shift mutations and we'll have a look at what frame shift mutations are in just one second um, there are also electromagnetic radiations those are like the most prominent ones they happen um, they're high energy and they can cause and they are highly penetrative they alter DNA bonding which causes the rearrangement of the structure and um, and now we know that you know because of the processes that are occurring in the DNA they can have a huge impact um, on on the genome and as a result cause mutations an example of an electromagnetic radiate uh, radi radiation um, mutant is UV light so radiation from the Sun can be super harmful in high doses and as a result it, it can cause pyrimidine dimer uh, dimers so that is when you would have um, the bases sort of and actually there's an image here I, I was trying to explain it with my hand but i'm pretty sure i've got an image here for us so this is the electromagnetic um, spectrum and we can see that in terms of electromagnetic radiation we would know that um you know gamma rays so it goes from radio to gamma and this side um as you go along it becomes more penetrative so that's that 
Okay, moving on. Um, so now, here we go. These are our pyrimidine dimers. So we've got, um, as you can see, so radiate what happens as a result of radiation to the DNA. So there can be hydrogen bondage breaking, uh, breakage. So by now, as we would know that the um, that the bonds are joined, so the uh, the bases are they have hydrogen bonds, you know, holding them together. So hydrogen bonds he can break. They can also be pyrimidine dimers. So this is when you can see the bases they turn inwards to connect to one another instead of connecting straight across. Um, there can be a loss in bases, base change, cross linkage can also happen. Um, they can be single strand break and also protein cross linkage. So there are lots of things things that can happen here. I would say I don't really know pyrimidine dimers what that is, how that happens. Um, and of course, hydrogen bond breakage. And yeah, those are the sort of the big ones that we need to know because they have a huge role, you know, changing the structure of the DNA. Okay, moving on now to uh, inquiry question um, two. So how does mutation introduce new alleles into a population? So firstly, as you can see here, these are... Um, the firstly the result of mutagens so it can have a huge impact on phenotypic uh, on phenotypic expression um and as you can see here we've got ionizing radiation that has affected the dna so we've got the x-rays or gamma rays over here breaking the single strand and also breaking the double strand on the other hand we've got known uh we've got uh, non-ionizing radiation which causes pyrimidine dimers to form between um thymine so they can form between thymine uh thymine and um guanine uh no yes yes it's always Good to remember that. Um, but this is an example here of thymine dimers. So these are forming between two thymine bases. So that's that. All right. Let's have a look now at the what happens as a result of these mutations. So we've got point mutations. So point mutations are known. Um, so point mutations are a type of mutations that happen as a result of damage to DNA and there are two sort of distinct categories for them. The first one is a substitution so that they can be substitution mutations or they can be frame shift mutations. So with substitute so with frame shift mutations there are two specific types there is insertion or deletion. So we've basically got the three types of mutations that happen as a result of these and the three effects so the three types are they can be silent mutations so silent mutations is when there is no effect on the uh codon on the uh, on the dna so that there's no effect it's silent it doesn't have any effect on the dna the second is um missense which is uh the when we see a change in the amino acid because the codons have been disturbed there has been a change in the codons finally we've got a nonsense mutation which means that a stop codon has been prematurely introduced which is going to affect the um it is going to prematurely stop the process um and affect the dna that is being produced sorry that is going to affect the proteins um and the peptide synthesis that's happening so that those are firstly point mutations. Now we've got chromosomal mutations. Now chromosomal mutations um, is when we, actually let me just quickly go back just because I realized I forgot to mention something. So with point mutations that's the big category so there are point mutations but there are two types of point mutations there's substitution when a base has been switched out and then this framework when either a base has been inserted or it has been deleted and so as a result you get to see three different types of effects uh, sorry three different types of changes and then this uh, and then this specific effects so just wanted to flag that out <laughs> Okay, let's have a look now at um, chromosomal mutations. So chromosomal mutations um, usually occur as a result um, of errors that happen during meiosis. And crossing over 
and that could be because crossing over occurs incorrectly so there can be chunks of dna that were screwed up and that can cause structural mutations to happen um we can also see sister chromatids being incorrectly separated so during anaphase um you know when the uh, chromosomes are supposed to separate the DNA could not like it may not be separated properly which can then again cause a number of mutations as well so let me just check my charges plugged in just sparkling oh good all right I'm just making sure yep okay perfect so let's now have a look at um the effects of it. The effects are usually severe because now we've got issues, um, you know, within the DNA happening, um, at a bigger level. Like it's happened during myosis, and it is going to affect the phenotypic expression. But it's also going to affect, um, their gametes. In in some cases, it can affect their gametes as well, depending on what the mutation is. So, there are four types of structural chromosomal mutations they include deletion so deletion is when a chunk of that chromosome has been deleted as suggested by the name there is inversion when a part of that dna has been inverted inside out we also have translocation when a part of the dna has been misplaced so so uh, the chromosome has been um displaced and finally we have duplication where a part of the chromosome has been duplicated so those are the four types of structural mutations and um if you've got mutations in the number of chromosomes which can again happen if you know we've seen if it's happening during meiosis and it affects the separation of the strands there can be mutations um in the number of chromosomes and there are two main times there's anapoleity and polypoleity so anapoleity is when the overall number of chromosomes of the offspring differs to that of the parents uh, of the parents so, for example, in Down syndrome, the individual has 47 chromosomes instead of the usual 46 chromosomes. And that is because they have um, three copies of chromosome, uh, of chromosome number 21. So that's adiplady. Then we've got polypoleity, which is when an organism contains more than two sets of homologous chromosomes. So, for example... Um, Tripolity is a condition in which the fetus has three copies of every homologous chromosome instead of two copies. Um, and that is obviously going to have a severe effect, um, you know, on a large number of genes. So, um, we've got, uh, so as I introduced you early to Chutzpa, here are some examples of, uh, for example, um, our little guides to looking at mutations and these um and i he i tutor biology here at cheat spots i tutor biology pdhp and english advanced and this is um you know what, one of the examples of how we like to deliver our content obviously um we have a very similar sort of slide uh not slide structure sorry they have a very similar structure in terms of you know going through the slides but um some of the resources and the way in which we present our content includes like infographics like this which can be so helpful in visualizing what is happening um and these are here for you if you want to have a look and use them and add on to your notes as well okay now let's have a look at the second big dot point which is biotechnology so with biotechnology our inquiry question is how do genetic technologies affect earth's biodiversity so this is something that you will come back to um that you have obviously looked at briefly in module five and you will come back to in module seven and eight as well like you will come back to this idea of biotechnology um and we are going to go through module seven in a while so you'll sort of see how that ties up with module six so there are three different types of um uses of biotechnology that we are looking at 
Firstly, we're looking at the use of biotechnology in health, so medical biotechnology. And examples of that include, of course, biofarms, but those are not just the only one. Um, and the big examples, you know, of biotech, of, my, of medical biotech is vaccines and antibiotics. Having now, you know, gone through the pandemic, we are all very aware of um, vaccines and, you know, antivirals and stuff and how they've played a huge role um, in curbing the pandemic. There are also stem cell treatments that are being developed and that have, uh, some, are, some have been developed, some are being developed and there are changes being made um, and, that, and that includes skin grafts, treatment of, can, uh, of cancers and autoimmune diseases. We also have industrial biotech. So some examples include um, biocompatible materials like biopolymers derived and also produced by bacteria or plants um, and, and as well as by degradable plastics. Uh, living in a world where we are currently dealing with the effects of climate change, um, along with obviously many other issues, biodegradable plastics play, uh, you know, will have, uh, will play um, a huge role in the way in which our world functions. So that is, uh, again, something that is being constantly researched and improved. <laughs> We also have the use of enzyme biotechnologies and um, processes like fermentation and food production that once again play a huge role in making industrial processes more efficient. Finally, we've got environmental biotechnology um, and we will again be talking about all of them in a lot more depth, but I think environmental biotech is one of those um, that we sort of no, like we, we we use every day, but we don't really think about that as like biotechnology, right? So we've got um, bioremedi uh, bioremediation, which is development of microorganisms to help clean up pollution. And we also have the use of genetically modified crops and organisms um, in agriculture that is being used to better, um, you know, suit a changing environment. And that is something, for example, you know, BT cotton, corn, um, our bananas, Cavendish bananas, all genetically modified. So it is something that we obviously, uh, you know, that we interact with every day, use every day, but we may not actually consider it biotech. So... Uh, he is, um, so here are the different, the three different types of genetic technologies that we will be looking at um, in this module. You will see that in the syllabus, some of them are specified. So the ones that I've highlighted in um, pink there for you, those are the ones that are specified in syllabus. But of course, you still want to know examples of the other of the others as well. So we've got reproductive technologies, including artificial insemination, which is used in the livestock industry. We've got in vitro fertilization, so IVF, which is, um, you, uh, which is a fertility treatment. And finally, we've got artificial pollen uh, pollination um, which is used in agriculture so these three are reproductive technologies then we've got cloning techniques and cloning techniques include firstly whole organism cloning so it's used widely in livestock industry I think by now we would all know Dolly the sheep so Dolly the sheep is an example of um, an, of whole organism cloning there are many other out there now um, another one is in jazz the camel um, that was a camel in the Middle East that was um, cloned. We also have therapeutic cloning, which is uh, happening in medicine. Again, a field that is being still being researched and explored. Finally, we've got gene cloning, which is happening in both medicine and industry. So, like I said, the ones in pink are the ones that are highlighted in the syllabus, so you definitely need to know those. And the ones in blue, of course, are extra examples that I still think you should know just in case, you know, you get a question where you don't want to keep talking about one thing and you can bring in other relevant examples. Uh, and, and the syllabus also says including but not limited to. So it might it said it's a good idea to have some extra examples up your sleeves. Uh, and finally, we've got recombinant DNA technology. So that includes gene sequencing, which is used in medicine and research, it includes transgenesis, um, which is also used in agriculture and biotech, gene therapy, ELISA and CRISPR, which is used in medicine and is a molecular tool. 
So here I've got an example for us. So we've gone through the content and now um, let's have a go at adapting it to this uh, to this specific question, which is from the 2019 paper. The application of reproductive technologies in plants, uh, in plant and animal breeding limits genetic diversity. So to what statement is this uh, statement correct? A question like this, to what extent you need to specify what your point, uh, what your opinion is. You know, you have to say to a significant extent this is true, or this is um, this is uh, this is not true, or or this is um untrue to a great extent. Something like that, where you actually answering the question, um, and. With a question like this, you need to be able to, like, there's a lot that you can talk about. So structure is crucial. It is six, it is worth six marks. So that's very important. Um, so structure is crucial and organizing your points to sort of come back to this big idea, almost think a bit like an English essay, you know, you want all your evidence to link back to your main thesis, to your main contention, your main argument. So kind of going um, through that structure. So let's not be scared. Let's now have a go at um, how we would structure this. So if we've got a question like this, I would obviously want to have an introduction that gives me definition of, um, you know, reproductive technologies and how they are being used in plant and animal breeding and evaluation, right? So, so that is the part of how they're being used evaluator for me and through that answer to what extent do you think this is true then in your body paragraphs you are um giving me examples and arguments to link back to your main contention and prove that hey you are right um and here i might talk about two specific technologies so for each one i will define what they are describe the um so describe brief give a brief um, outline of how they work an example and then comment on does it limit genetic diversity so i have to give examples of um reproductive technology because that is what the question is asking me to do the question wants to know if the application of reproductive technologies in plant and animal breeding limits genetic diversity so i need to give examples to back my point up here and finally uh, we want a conclusion that ties everything together and reinforces your, uh, your evaluation. So here you link back to your body paragraphs. Again, like in English, you're signposting your themes. That is kind of what you're doing here. So that is that. Let us now move on to module seven. Um, there's a lot going on here. I'll just flag that out before we get started. So we'll take it nice and easy. I want you to take it nice and easy and we'll work through this together. Um, I will be talking through a lot of new concepts as well. So I just want you to, um, you know, see if you want to jot down some sort of the big ideas, any terms and definitions that are going to be helpful. Um, and of course, some of the processes like, you know, immunization and stuff, there's a lot going on there. So, you know, after you sort of go away from the lecture, um, I would definitely recommend to further research or, you know, or for like, especially that specific topic of how the immune system works. Um, definitely, you know, go ahead, like watch lot. There are lots of good YouTube videos too that I recommend that I find really helpful in visualizing the whole process. So let's go through this um, and I'll start off by outlining what the key concepts are. So that is what I'll be doing. Um, and I just want you to, again, jot down the key, sort of the key um, big ideas and just try your very best to sort of follow along and ask lots and lots of questions, please. Um, OK, so the first dot point that we're looking at, like always, uh, well, not always because the last module had three dot points this one has four so the first one is what are the causes of infectious diseases so we're looking specifically at the causes of infectious disease and our inquiry question is how are diseases transmitted so how do they you know go about um infecting you know how do they go about infecting one person to the other so how does that happen now 
causes of infectious diseases. Basically, we're looking at what are these things trying to kill us every second because there's bacteria and viruses and pathogens everywhere. So we will look at the causes um, of different diseases. So what the types of murderous pathogens are and how do they go about you know, trying to achieve their target. We will look at transmission. Uh, we will discuss uh, an experiment that was done a that was done in order to um, in order to sort of identify how a disease is transmitted and sort of conclude um, you know like what causes diseases and finally what the impact is on society. So what is a pathogen? A pathogen may be a word that you have um, probably heard. Or, or not yeah probably heard now that now after the pandemic but uh, or may not have had or may not have had heard so a pathogen is any agent that causes or is capable of causing um, disease to the host so any uh, yes yeah, so anything that causes a disease um, and obviously endangers the host so the criteria for a pathogen is for a pathogen to sort of uh, to sort of succeed is that firstly it needs a host in order to hijack the host, um, you know, cells or, or in whatever way they operate, like a virus does that by hijacking the cells of a host, while something like um, a macro parasite finds um, <laughs> it finds habitat inside an individual um, and uses their nutrients and whatnot. So it differs based on every pathogen, but generally they need a host, like they need a host, and they can only cause infectious diseases that tra that transmit from one person to the other. They cannot cause non-infectious diseases. So the terms um, that I'd like you to remember here are microbes. Microbes refer to microorganism. Anything that's small cannot be seen with the naked eye. Um, all pathogens are microbes, but all microbes are not pathogens. We have lots of good microbes in, for example, in our gut, right? And we need them as well. So not all of them are pathogens. Um, for example, microflora in our gut, not pathogens, play a huge role in um, helping us maintain good gut health. So let's have a look at the types of pathogens. You'll have to remember what they are and also examples of diseases that they cause. Um, the way they are structured is through like incremental in terms of their sizes. So we start off with like prions, which are like 235 amino acids long. And we go all the way up to macroparasites that can be up to like 25 centimeters long. So it's sort of that progression. So prions are proteinaceous infectious particles and they are abnormally folded protein, transmits misfolded protein state to other cellular proteins. And an example of this is the mad cow disease. We then have virus. So they're not cellular um, and they're basically nucleic acid. Um, then you've got the nucleic acid in a protein envelope and they replicate inside living cells so they what they do is they bind to the host cells they gain entry into the host cells and they've got mechanisms that help them do that and once they're inside the host cells they hijack processes uh, and in the case of COVID-19 for example once it gains entry into the host cells through um, the use of enzymes in its uh like enzymes on its surface against uh against entry into the host cell and hijacks uh, uh protein synthesis in order to then control the cell um and if it does that and and i want i don't want to go into too much detail but basically if it um that can actually that that has caused ARDS, which is that can cause ARDS, which is one of the leading causes of death from COVID-19. So that's like a respiratory disease. Um, so that's how it works. And generally all viruses do that, but obviously differing uh, based on the virus, it differs. So with SARS-CoV-19, the SARS is the virus that causes COVID-19. SARS also caused um, the first coronavirus that happened I think in 2006 or yeah 2006 um, and there are other also diseases that it has caused like the um, MERS virus in the Middle East. 
Okay, so an example of that is measles, right? <laughs> and of course, COVID-19. Um, bacteria, so bacteria is a single-celled prokaryotic organism. It, re it reproduces by binary fission. So you, hopefully we all know what binary fission is from module 5. And it secretes toxins, invades cells, um, and forms biofilms. And an example of this is salmonella. Then we've got protozoa. So now we go into eukaryotic organisms. So single-celled, it's a eukaryotic organism. And it basically absorbs nutrients from hosts. It secretes toxins, invades cells, and forms biofilms as, biofilms as well. An example of a protozoa is malaria. And we will talk about malaria in like one second. Finally, uh, no, actually we've got two more to go. So we've got fungi, which is eukaryotic. It can be multi uh, multicellular. And it, rep uh, and it reproduces by spreading spores. An example of a disease thrush. And finally, we've got macroparasites, which are visible to the naked eye. And they can include ectoparasites, those that live on the organism. And also endoparasites that live within the organism so things like ticks and tapeworms are an example of that okay so malaria um you'll have to investigate uh, and this is in the uh syllabus so you'll have to investigate the transmission of a disease during an epidemic so um there are a couple to choose from um including uh yeah, including like Ebola um, is another one, but you can sort of choose any, but I've chosen to go through malaria today uh, because just because it's a really popular one that um, that's really interesting to, I guess, research as well. So malaria is caused by a protozoa and specifically it is caused by the plasmodium protozoa. The plasmodium protozoa is found in the gut of the Anopheles female mosquitoes and it transmits via um, vector transmission so once um so it transmits when an infected female Anopheles mosquito goes ahead and bites uh, a human and from there so once they've bitten a human you've got a mosquito bite the Bacteria, uh, the protozoa is the pathogen is transferred into your body, it goes through to your lungs, and the next time another mosquito bites you, let's say another female mosquito that does not have the, uh, the protozoa bites you, they can take away that protozoa, like it goes, um, it circulates to them, and that is how the disease spreads. So we've got, um, as that was like a little summary, so let's have a look at what actually happens. So, firstly, we've got the plasmodium sex cells which reproduce in the Anopheles mosquito's stomach, forming zygos in the cysts of the stomach wall. Then these cysts burst and sporozytes travel to the salivary glands of the mosquito and from there it is transferred to humans when they bite humans. Um, sporozytes then travel to the liver, sorry not the lungs, the liver, and they enter the red blood cells um, and continually multiply and they can actually cause, um, they cause the red blood cells to rupture as well because they're continually multiplying within the red blood cells um, and infected cells burst which causes malarial fe fever and finally the cycle continues when the human host is bitten by a mosquito which passes those mature um, plasmodium cells back to another not back to but to the mosquito because what happens is once you have been affected once you have been infected with malaria um it's like the uh plasmodium protozoa it stays within your body so you can't get rid of it which is why people see like relapses of malaria because um it stays like you it's hard to get rid of uh, but there have been treatments for it um but now the plasmodium um protozoa has become quite um oh what's the word it has uh it has actually become um quite uh resistant it has become quite resistant to the uh to antibiotics no uh, it has become quite resistant to the treatment and so as a result that treatment is um i mean people still use it but it actually is not as effective as when it was first um delivered so you can see in the diagram over there we've got um 
let me get a pen i really love using a pen um hopefully you can see my screen okay so we've got okay here we go so we've got the transmission to the host that happens here and then those sporozoites those are sporozoites they go straight to the um hepatocytes to our red blood cells um and they affect our red blood cells in the liver from there they do mitotic replication so they are replicating ridiculously fast in the uh, red blood cells and as a result our liver cells and um our liver cells rupture and those um mirozytes which are now mature they are released once they're released um what happens is they undergo uh, they undergo sexual cycle to produce gametes instead and you can see here so they're producing gametes within the human body so you've got the ring um the trophocyte schizocytes are uh, producing the gametes over here and then it ruptures again lets it out and then from there once a mosquito bites that human it goes back it goes into the mosquitoes um and the gametes made they undergo meiosis they migrate through the midgut wall forms oocytes and sorry oocysts and the sporozoites develop and the cycle starts again so with all of this you can clearly see the way in which um you know it continues to sort of circulate and it is hard to get rid of it is a disease that you know it's hard to eradicate because firstly we've got vector transmission by um by mosquitoes and then even after you know you've got the disease it remains in your body and that is why you get people get relapses you know malarial fevers because it gets re re reactivated but but essentially yes it comes back up and as a result the cells start multiplying again and then the you know they bust and they cause malarial fever and so on um and we will talk a bit about what happens when we look at prevention and stuff later on in the doc point but you don't need to know like in that much detail you kind of just want to know what i've got here in the doc points for us all the sort of the terms here that's just uh, me going into a bit extra detail because I personally find it very interesting and I think it's um, interesting to sort of understand what's happening at the root levels but you just have to know what the main points are and how it's uh, transmitted just because you can get uh, questions which are asking you you know uh, how does a named disease transmit um, transmit and affect people <laughs> obviously it's going to be worded different but something like that and that's when you want to be able to name a disease and go through the steps of um how it infects everyone so now we look at an experiment that um you will do in class which is um which aims to investigate the presence of microbes in different water sources so um basically this is just to sort of give you a summary of what it might look like um obviously the results and you know the results will differ based on the areas that you test and your sort of um, experimental des uh, design but basically um when it comes to experiments you want to aim you want to have clear and concise aims and hypothesis right so aim what are we investigated what are we investigating then hypothesis what will happen um what will, what will we see uh then your descriptive methods you can write out um in an exam so appropriate detail they can ask you to write out an experiment in the exam i'm pretty sure they did that in 2021 if i'm not wrong so something very similar to this uh you then want to look at what your expected results are obviously after you've done your experiment you would know what your results and you, and you want to remember them um you obviously also want to talk about validity and reliability so validity and reliability validity is is the experiment testing the aim and reliability is can the results be seen as consistent uh, sorry as consistent accuracy to what degree are the results precise and you need to be able to apply these principles to the experiment 
finally, um, vari uh, the, vari uh, <laughs> the variables which you need to understand. So having a good understanding of the variables is important. You should be able to tell them apart. Like especially, I think one thing that always confuses everyone is the difference between controlled variables and having a control. So an independent variable is the one that is being manipulated, while the dependent variable is the one that is being tested. Uh, so in this case, our independent variable is the water source that we are using. Our dependent variable is the microbial growth that we are that we want to see um, in the uh, in the type of water. So the amount and also the species. Um, we're then looking at the controlled variables. So things that we're keeping the same. So in each sample, we have, for example, the same amount of water, uh, the same temperature at, at which we are culturing those um, agar plates and, the and also doing it for the same time. Finally, controls, uh, we can have a, a control can be a sealed unopened agar plate which has nothing growing on it that can be a, that can be a control because ultimately that will tell you that you know there's no bacteria grown on it because it's been unopened it's sealed in comparison to um the agar plates that have got the sterilized water uh pond water and sea water so this might differ based on what your um what your school decides to use like if they just want to use like i don't know water from a nearby lake instead of a sea whatever works um but you kind of you'll probably have these four sets wait oh sorry you'll have these four sets essentially okay now we have a look at the modes of transmission so you've already had um so you've talked about patterns we have sort of been introduced to vector transmission when we've looked at malaria we'll now have a look at the different modes of transmission and there are essentially two main modes of transmission there is a horizontal mode of transmission and a vertical mode of transmission horizontal is when it's direct control i just like to think of it like horizontal as in pro like proper horizontal and just helps me think of like direct Contra uh, direct con uh, contact um, it can also include indirect contact um, it includes vector transmission and contamination so these four are part of the horizontal mode of transmission then we've got the vertical mode of transmission and that includes transplacental transmission vaginal birth um, and also breastfeeding so for example um, with breastfeeding if the mother has any um, pathogens like uh any pathogens they can be transmitted to the uh to the child same thing um yeah same thing with vaginal birth and also transplacental transmission okay so now we look at two big experiments that really shaped um the way in which uh, infectious the way in, that really changed our understanding of infectious diseases obviously we now live um you know in a time where our understanding of infectious diseases and um the technology that we are using to counter them has increased and and evolved significantly in a really nice way um it wasn't the same as when the initial scientists who sort of set out on the spot were doing their research so the first that uh scientists that we're looking at is louis pasha and louis uh and louis pasha is um he is important because he disproved the theory of spontaneous generation so people used to think that um bacteria just in uh, oh pathogens just spontaneously infect things he instead said that it's not spontaneous. It's not just happening randomly out of nowhere. There's a reason for it. And he proposed the germ theory of disease, which says that all things come from pre-existing things. And to us now, that is like the most logical thing ever, right? But at the time, because they didn't have the scientific research to back that, they were just like, oh, it just happened. It can just happen. But he said, no, it is happening because it's coming from something that's pre existing and that has contact with whatever it is that is being infected and um he shows that through his swan necked flask experiment so what he did is he took flasks with bent swan necks and what happened was with the swan necked um glass the particles 
in the air cannot travel through these necks without getting stuck. So if I've got something like, so firstly, let's let's start here. So I've got two um, different groups. I start off by applying heat to both groups. So uh, by applying heat, initially what happens is I'm almost, you know, I'm sterilizing it. I'm killing any bacteria in it by applying heat to it. I then let the flask sit for a while. But with one, I let it sit while it's closed so while it is closed but with this one i open the flask so i'm removing so i'm removing the neck and i'm letting it sit when that happens that means that suddenly all the microbes in the air have access to this solution right here so as a result all the microbes um all the microbes from the air are going to come in and that is going to lead to bacteria being present in the flask however if i let the uh, if i let the flask sit and i'm not removing it i'm leaving it as it is because of this passageway into the um into the flask you would see that there's no bacteria present because bacteria cannot you know come in through here travel upwards and go down here it gets stuck here on the side so as a result there's no bacteria present and yeah so basically apply the heat break the neck observe the growth flask with broken neck means that there's microbe growth and flask with no broken uh with, without the broken neck means that there's no growth and that basically tells us that the um you know it's not spontaneous generation it's basically that the disease uh, and the bacteria is coming from pre-existing microbes in the air that get access to these solutions right there Okay. Next, we look at Koch, uh, next we look at Koch's postulates. So, this is where he developed a procedure for isolating and identifying microbes which cause disease. So he wanted to sort of see what is, um, you know, whether or not it is microbes that are causing disease. So what he did was, in all organisms with the disease, he says that. So he let's logically work through his steps. He said that in all animals that have a certain disease, there is there are going to be microorganisms, microbes present that are going to cause that disease. Microbes, uh, those microbes can then be isolated and they can be grown in pure culture. So if I've got postulate one where the same microorganism, uh, so I'm trying to prove the same microorganisms are present in every case of the disease. So the symptoms are the same more than likely there's there are going to be same microorganisms that are affecting that are infecting um these organisms so here my potential microorganism is the anthrax uh, bacilli so what happens is i'm going to uh i'm going to isolate that microorganism and grow it in a culture so how do i isolate it i isolate it from a dead uh, from the from a tissue of a dead animal and I make a pure culture so I grow it in like an agar plate in my culture then I then um what I do is I take the culture and I take the microorganisms from the pure culture that I've grown and I inoculate that into a healthy susceptible animal into another animal not the most ethical thing to do but hey that's what he did so when when we inoculate a healthy organism with a pure culture it develops the same symptoms as the original organism because it's got those same symptoms right what that what that tells us is that ultimately it's that same microbe is causing that disease however what we do is we isolate and regrow that microorganism from a newly from that newly infected organism and we do the process one more time and so if same then we realize that hey it's that microorganism that is causing the disease so like i said not the most ethical experiment but that is how he was able to prove that you know microbes are causing disease so every time you see similar symptoms more than likely it's the same microbe okay so um we've already talked about this but i'll just quickly go through this again because it is going to come up later so direct contact easiest way to catch the disease um you would know from you, you would know from COVID 19 
from the pandemic, you know, no shaking hands, you did elbows, even fist bump was like not recommended, um, always elbows, and so that is because there's a physical contact that's happening. Then we've got indirect contact, and that occurs when pathogens can live outside of host cells. So pathogens live in the environment after being spread to so something like influenza, where the pathogens are in the air, like after someone sneezes or coughs, the um, the particles um, are in the air, and that can easily cause, um, and someone can easily contract that as vector transmission. So insects like malaria, like mosquitoes and ticks, which cause the Lyme disease, they can pass on the disease. And finally, uh, contamination. So pathogens can be harbored in food and water, and there's abundance of nutrients um, because there's abundance of nutrients in food and water that encourages growth. With vector, we talked about transplacental, so, fr- um, so the fetus can um, get a disease from the mother via the placenta and examples of transplacental transmission include HIV and herpes, vaginal birth and um, because there's microflora present in the mother's birthing canal that can be passed on to the child during birth and examples include sexual sexually transmitted diseases and finally breastfeeding so fluids and nutrients um, can potentially infect um, can potentially pass on uh, infectious diseases um, through the milk to the child. Okay, so now let us, now we're sort of slowly starting to venture into the process of what actually happens um, and we will talk about immune system very shortly, which I think uh, most of the time people love talking about, like that's their favourite bit in um, module 7. And it, 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 that's fair, right? Because it is a really amazing topic. So let's now start thinking about how adaptations are occurring in um, in the host and also that are occurring um, more specifically in, uh, yeah, that is more specifically occurring in both the host cells and also the uh, pathogens that facilitate entry and transmission. <laughs> So entry first, there are cell wall degrading enzymes that the uh, pathogen will have that are able to degrade the plasma, uh, the cytoplasmic membrane of the host cell. They can also have toxins which damage host tissues and also they can disable the host immune system. They can also have effector proteins. So effector proteins are proteins which are secreted to help pathogens to enter the cell and suppress their host defences. And um, with the case of COVID-19, effector proteins are used um, in order for the cell to sort of get into the host membrane through like fusion. Um, It's a, it's a, Obviously, there's so many different proteins involved, um, but that's one of the ways in which it happens. also, the cell can, sorry, the pathogen can uh, can um, be adhesive to the cell wall of the uh, to the cells of the host, and that can help them colonize the tissues. Finally, we also have extremophiles, path- uh, extremophile pathogens, which can help survival inside, um, which can help survival inside the host cells. So now let's look at transmission. So firstly, protective covering, we've got bacterial capsules and viral envelopes. Reservoirs, they can be, they can allow long-term survival outside of hosts. So this is how they are basically, um, ho- these cells are basically, you know, protecting themselves um, while they're waiting to get into another, you know, into another host cell. So they like I said, they've got protective coverings. They can rest in reservoirs. So through that, they can survive for a while before they gain a host. Um, they can also use vectors in some cases, which increases transmission efficiency. So that, as we saw with the plasmodium protozoa, and they and the vectors can help carry the pathogen from one host to another. Structural adaptations, so injection machinery like with mosquitoes. Um, And finally we've got rapid species evolution, so higher rates of mutation during replication which allows for new adaptations to arise. And we saw that with the COVID-19 pandemic where we started off with first the coronavirus, we went from alpha to beta to gamma to um, the Omicron virus, right? So this whole the way in which it replicated quite quickly and became more 
powerful as time and more um, yeah more powerful as time went by. Okay, so that is our first stop point done. Please feel free to ask any questions. Um, stop me, right? And I'm more than happy to go through any questions. And I will, yeah, I'll, I'll be answering them live as we go. So hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully we're f feeling pretty okay with that. And uh, there was a lot happening. Um, but hopefully we are sort of feeling confident with, obviously, pathogens what they are examples of different pathogens and those two experiments that we talked about as well we're now looking at the next stop point which is um how what are the responses to pathogens and our inquiry question is how does a plant or animal respond to infection so let's have a look so for this question you will have to uh, so, sorry for this stop point you will have to um, essentially memorize and be able to talk about a named Australian plant um, through and, and you can obviously gain knowledge of that through either practical or secondary sourced investigation more than likely you'll be doing secondary sourced information so here is an example for us. We've got a pathogen known as the myrtle rust. Um, and the myrtle rust affects um, the Metacea family of plants in Australia, including eucalyptus, bottle brush, tea trees. So you want to know an Australian plant, um, a named Australian plant. And there are many out there, but this is one of them. And the description of this disease, well, the myrtle, uh, the myrtle rust is a fungal disease. It attacks new growth, so shoot tips and young stems. Um, you, it is recognized, and the symptoms include the small purple spots, um, or a small purple spots that have bright yellow spores. Also, it spreads by releasing spores like fungal um, pathogens do. It is found in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and Tasmania and the way in which the plant itself responds to this um, pathogen includes firstly by putting up by um, using its mechanical barriers like the, uh, like its thick cell walls, tough stems. It also uses um, secretory glands like eucalyptus oil which is antimicrobial. Um, non-specific it also has non-specific immune responses which include production of harmful metabolites and also upregulation of um, antifungal proteins in order to encounter the um, in, in order to encounter the uh, the pathogen itself and I've got links there for you if you want to use this as an example that you can use to further research I would definitely recommend going ahead and um, yeah researching a bit more in order to have you know like have a response ready to go but um yeah let's move on now to having a look at um yeah so like i was talking about earlier i'll be going through some resources again that we offer here at chutma and here is an example of um our exact so yeah so with our service i guess we essentially um and with my classes like we essentially do topic tests every term um not every term sorry every topic which translates to like every term um and we also do our very own half yearlies and um trials too which happen like three to four weeks before your trials at school so in the holidays to help you um prepare for them so what like the way i like to structure my classes is that you know we go through the content we try to spend an uh and lesson like a whole lesson on one doc point and then through that you know finish the module in four to five lessons then spend some time revising the module and then going ahead and doing a topic test on that specific module um and i found that you know it works really well for everyone because it helps them obviously uh, prepare for the uh for, for the for the exams or the assignments and for trials and the HSC in the long term and we of course also have um, resources for prelim students as well and here is an example of those resources like I love to make um, for example flashcards and you know other study resources to help um, to help students here is another example this is um, an example of 
year 11 content that we have and this is again for year 11 students helping you organize your notes and lots of practice questions and practice papers as well okay now let's move on to um to immunity so now i guess this again is the sort of the meaty part of the topic um this is where we get to go into a lot of detail with the human immune system but i just want to make sure that we are not overwhelmed by it um i will be going through this very slowly because i know sometimes i have a habit of talking fast so i'll be slowly stepping us through through this so trust me um and of course please ask questions um as we go clarify anything that you have to no question is a silly question something that is super important to always remember no question is a silly question so let's have a look firstly we are looking at how does the body you know that's our practice question how does the immune human immune response respond to a uh, human immune system respond to exposure to a pathogen so there are mechanisms in our body that are in place to respond to pathogens the first um defense the first line of defense is part of the innate immunity the innate immunity essentially has the first line of defense and the second line of defense and it is non-specific so it's non-specific to different pathogens so it doesn't discriminate between i'm only going to work if it's a virus or you know it doesn't discriminate between the transmission of the disease uh, of the disease uh, so it's non-specific and it is um it is non-specific and it's fast as well so the first line of defense includes first uh, specifically um, these physical barriers which are trying to stop the pathogen from getting in. We've got cilia which are hair like projections that line our airways and they move in a wave in a wave like motion to push pathogens away from the lung. So here um, as you can see here they're right this is this is an example of cilia. And what they're doing is, because they're moving in a wave-like uh, uh, motion, they're trying to push the pathogens away from the lung. And a lot of the time, the pathogens get stuck in the cilia, so they don't go through to the lung. The second one that we are looking at is mucous membranes. So mucous membranes line openings, uh, so cell, cells lining the openings of the body, they secrete mucus. And that mucus traps the pathogens and particles. So this is again important in ensuring that um, the... <laughs> the pathogen doesn't get past you know your sort of your uh, it doesn't get through to your lungs so we've got that in our noses for example so it's about ensuring that it does not get so that particles that we breathe in don't make it to the lungs then we've got chemical barriers so these chemical barriers include for example stomach acids some stomach acid is very strong um very acidic in our guts and it is all about ensuring not in the gut sorry um works obviously you know in that region with them but um stomach acid is super important in ensuring that um any harmful bacteria like they don't um survive those conditions because it is such and because it because it is so acidic uh there are also alkali contents of the small intestine intestine and enzymes in amounts that again if you breathe in any bacteria or any pathogens they are uh, they ensure that again they like they're very best to make sure that those pathogens don't travel down to more to our important organs like lungs and you know start infecting them we then have secretions so these are fluids which are secreted from the body including sweat glands um hair follicles and urine uh, so sorry so fluids are created from these specific parts of sweat glands hair follicles and urinary tract and what they do is they aim to um flush out pathogens and they're also antimicrobial last but not least the skin the skin itself is a protective layer um if you've sort of had a chance to go learn a bit about skin you'd notice that um the skin that you know we have right now it's it's a protective layer um what we have underneath this 
part is what is called the true skin and that's the epidermis that's the actual you know um skin this is basically a protective layer for us and it um secretes so the pores in our skin secretes antimicrobials and the outer layer of skin is constantly shedding as well um and that is again so that we are getting rid of any pathogens that are on there um and obviously our cells need to um our cells need to grow So the first barrier is the skin, the second barrier is the cilia, then we've got chemical barriers um, and so on. So these two are related, I guess. So we've got cilia and mucous membranes, chemical barriers and secretions. And the first one is the skin. So that's the main one. Then we've got cilia, then we've got chemical barriers. So it's in the form where, you know, this is like... At the very beginning, the pathogen will encounter. If it makes past the skin, it's going to encounter the cilia. And if it makes past the cilia, it's going to encounter the chemical barriers um, in the body. Okay, so we now look at basically the first line of defense in a nutshell. Is that we've got the body's mechanical barriers. He's a pathogen trying to get in. Let me in, let me in. But it's fine to get high. But obviously we know that they do tend to make it in sometimes. But most of the times the uh, mechanical barriers do a pretty good job of uh, protecting the body. The second line of defense is also part of the innate immunity. And the second line of defense is um, the... It includes four specific things it includes the lymph system um firstly so the lymph system produces the white blood cells and these white blood cells are crucial um for majority of the immune response and they're basically networks of tissue and there are networks of tissues and organs which help to rid the body of toxins so we've got um cervical lymph nodes We've got cervical lymph nodes, the thoracic duct, the thymus right there, um, the spleen, the pelvic lymph nodes. So all of these tissues and organs that are working together to flush out um, toxins and waste from the body. Secondly, we've got inflammation. So inflammation is uh, basically swelling. So when there is the dilation of blood vessels and infiltration of inflammatory cells at the site of infection. And that causes heat, pain, redness, swelling and acute loss of function. So there are five cardinal signs of inflammation, pain, heat, redness, swelling and loss of function. That's the last one. Um, and that generally doesn't happen. It's usually sort of this, depending on obviously what the injury is. OK, we then have the second line of defense, which is um, uh, uh, sorry, the third part of the second line of defense, which first is phagocytosis. So this is definitely a term you want to remember, phagocytosis. So phagocytosis um, involves special white blood cells, including macrophages and uh, neutrophils. And what they do is, what, what phagocytosis includes is, um, these specific white blood cells change the shape, change their shape to engulf a pathogen. They basically eat up a pathogen. And... Um, they do this and then they destroy them using um, acid and, and lysomes play a huge role in um, in this process because lysomes, as you would know, generally are responsible for the waste um, and disposal. So they play a huge role in actually, firstly, we've got the, in, uh, the um, uh, sorry, from here. So what we see is that the special white blood cells here, for example, a macrophage goes ahead, it captures the pathogen right there. From there, it takes the pathogen into the body. And then we see these lysomes come across and they come through and they um, use acid to destroy the pathogen and through that the pathogen is destroyed and then it is dispersed from the cell right there. So that's phagocytosis. Then we've got cell death to seal off pathogens, and this is known as apoptosis. So this involves the cells, which are this time macrophages and lymphocytes. Um, uh, so in lymphocytes, which completely surround the pathogen, and then they die. So they form a cyst, and 
that cyst is um, filled with pus and through that they block pathogen movement and also block the nutrient supply to the pathogen which is obviously helping the pathogen and that causes it to die so as you can see here so normal that is a regular cell but now it's condensing so they're basically um once they've got their pathogen over here they're basically um completely they've surrounded it and they have and if it is um filled with pus it's forming a cyst and through that it is killed um and it leaves these fragments here so this is apoptosis right there so now we've gone through two very important um ideas the first and the second line of defense and both of them are part of the innate immunity with that uh, we will now look at adaptive immunity, but an adaptive immunity is basically the immune response. The first two, um, obviously the immune system plays a role, but we don't actually see the key players of immune system and innate immunity. They come through in adaptive immunity. So if you were to compare with innate immunity, firstly, innate immunity is always there. Your body, you know, there's mechanical barriers, they're always there. They're not, you know, sort of facing in and out, they're always there. <laughs> And it includes the first and second line of defense. Specificity is that it is non-specific. So it's not specific to a disease. You know, for example, your cilia um, is not only going to move when it sees a specific disease. It's non-specific and it aims to um, stop any disease from coming into your body. The response rate is rapid. This happens quite rapidly. Phagocytosis, apoptosis, these processes are happening rapidly. Um, does so is there immunological memory? So for example, do those cells remember oh, do those cells remember okay, this is how we have um for instance, you know, killed these cells? No. So that means that it does not have immunological memory. And so the keywords here are always um, to remember innate, right? So it's innate, it is constant, it is non-specific, there's a rapid response, um, and most importantly, there's no immunological memory. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand now, is something that arises when the pathogen enters the body. Once the pathogen has gained entry into the body and it is not being stopped earlier on and you know killed for example so for example in the early in innate immunity if it was sort of uh, stopped in the cilia or something um or if it was stopped let's say in the uh, in the stomach acid uh, oh well, actually not stopped there but it was you know in that region specifically the uh macrophages may come and induce phagocytosis and finish off the um the bacteria but that would mean that it has made that it has gained entry into the body basically so now adaptive immunity comes into play when the pathogen has gained entry into the um into the body and there are two main elements that you're always going to remember with this those are b cells and t cells so b for bat t for toy so b cells and t cells um and these and this response and these cells specifically are highly specific this response is specific it is tailored to the pathogen that enters the body so it's going to be very specific to that pathogen because every pathogen is of course different and needs to be dealt with differently and that is what the adaptive immunity does the response rate is that primary exposure is slow the first time that a pathogen enters your body the response is going to be slow and i'm going to explain in one second why that is however the second time that pathogen enters the body the response is going to be a lot faster and that is because the adaptive immunity has immunological memory the b cells and t cells actually remember how they dealt with a specific pathogen and so our keywords here are that it's adaptive, it is highly specific, it has immunological memory. Okay, so now we come to the really important part, um, which is the third line of defense. Like I said, there are two main cells that are involved. There are the B cells and the T cells. The B cells... Are involved in what we call the antibody mediated immunity so I would definitely jot this down 
the B cells are involved in the antibody mediated immunity and that is also known as humoral immunity so humor and then AL humoral immunity and what happens is we've got two types of B cells so B cells differentiate into two types of cells they differentiate into either plasma cells which provide immediate protection it secretes loads of antibodies and it has same specificity as the parent cell what does that mean so let me just take one step back when a cell every cell has antigens on it antigens and especially um the antigens is basically you know these sort of um these signs on the surface of the cell these little like uh receptors on the surface of the cell that tells the body that either these cells are foreign so if you've got a pathogen the body will recognize its antigens on the cell surface and go oh that's not that's not from our body that is from somewhere else but the other cells in our bodies would have antigens that the body recognizes as self right okay this is my cell i don't have to attack it the immune system goes i don't have to attack it because it is my cell but in some cases, you know, we like when you've, if you would have heard about autoimmunological diseases, and that happens because the body is not able to recognize um, its own cell, its own cells as like self cells, and that is why they attack those cells. So that happens with, for example, with type one diabetes with insulin cells, um, or, or the cells that produce insulin. But anyways, let's take one step back again. So what are antigens? Antigens are receptors on the surface of a cell that tell the body that allow the body to recognize um, foreign cells versus self cells so cells that are from your own body that is the key here so for those antigens that are not from your own body your body and specifically these plasma b cells produce antibodies and what those antibodies do is those antibodies go and bind to the antigen. And that is basically a way of flagging to the rest of the important cells. Hey, I found this specific um, pathogen in the body. It is, I've recognized that, that, you know, it has different antigens. We've recognized that and now we've made an antibody to it. So, so far, just, just keep that in mind. So the key words here are antigens and antibodies. So plasma cell provides immediate protection and secretes loads of antibodies to provide that immediate protection. Um, we will talk about, you know, that's not the whole process. It's a simplified process. We will go into it, but just for now, bear with me. So that's plasma cells. The second type of cell that is that the B cells differentiate into is memory B cells. Memory B cells, these are the cells that remember what the antibody produced was to that specific antigen. So these cells remember, you know, that, oh, this is the antigen and I have produced this antibody to it. So I need to remember these cells do that remembering. And so the next time, if you get that same pathogen, if it comes back, these are the, these are the cells that are going to go, oh, I already have the antibody for it. Let me go deal with it. Which is why that secondary exposure to a pathogen is faster because we already have the antibodies ready to go. So that's that. They also remain, like I said, they remain in circulation to allow for a quicker and stronger response upon reinfection. So that's the B cells. They are responsible for humoral. Um, let me write it down. Oh, I cannot write like that. Please excuse my handwriting. So these are humoral. Okay, there we go. Sorry, that was that took a lot of concentration. So yeah, so B cells are responsible for antibody mediated immunity or humoral immunity. That is the role of the B cells. Now let us look at the T cells. I'll try and draw like a line in between here. Okay. Cool. 
So the T cells are responsible for cell mediated immunity. I'm going to go through a schematic of what happens in each, but just give me one second. I promise we'll get through it. But first you need to know what these players are. So with B cells, there are two main players. B cells differentiate into plasma cells and memory B cells. T cells. They are responsible for cell mediated immunity and the way I like to remember these different types of T cells is to think of it like a friend group. Yep, so I like to think of it as a friend group. So we've got four types of friends. We have firstly the helper T cells. These helper T cells play a huge role in helping out the other white blood cells, including the B cells. Um, and what they do is they secrete cytokines to help coordinate the immune response. So once they latch on to the um, pathogen they secrete cytokines to then go ahead and like tell everyone hey there's a pa there's a pathogen here i found it come along we need to you know do the whole immune response so i like to remember the helper t cells as like the kind helpful friend in the group that's like really sweet that's how i like to think of the helper t cells so that's the helper t cells then we've got the cytotoxic killer t cells I love the name. I think it's such a strong name. Um, and these are basically the cells that cause destruction. They release cytotoxins, which kill target cells by triggering apoptosis. So they see a cell, they don't think they go ahead and they kill. That is what these cells do. That's why they're destructive. And I, re and I like to remember the cytotoxic killer T cells as like the really, you know, the, um, the really <laughs> angry friend of the group the friend that's always like ready to go ahead and fight um i like to remember it as like that friend of the group the cytotoxic killer t cells it's a killer t cell it's going to go ahead and cause destruction then we've got the suppressor t cell what the suppressor t cell does as you can see in the name is that it controls the immune response by basically controlling and suppressing the activity of the other t cells most importantly the cytotoxic killer t cell it tells the cytotoxic killer t cell to suppress its activity you know like mate you can't go ahead and kill all the cells and i like to think of the suppressor t cells as like the best friend to the cytotoxic killer t cells that always gives you that balance like hey you can't go overboard <laughs> you know there are some cells in the body that are our own so you just need to focus on just dealing with the pathogens and stop because basically cytotoxic killer t cells they're destructive and so the suppressor t cell is like the best friend that calms it down and just make sure it doesn't uh, that the cytotoxic killer T cells don't do anything rash. Finally, we've got the memory T cells. These guys I like to think as the intellectual, like awesome, smart kids of the group. These are the ones that are like, hey, you are all, you know, so busy in getting this whole response happening, but you forgot to actually remember what antibodies you used, how you actually went about, you know, doing this whole response. So the memory T cells give the immunological memory in the cell mediated um, immunity and they remain in circulation again to allow for quicker response next time that there's an infection. So that's a four main cells. Helper T cells, the kind, helpful ones in the group that are always ready to stand up for anyone. Cytotoxic killer T cells, the friend that is very hot headed, ready to go, ready to like fight anytime. The suppressor T cells, the best friend of that hot headed friend that go, no mate, you need to stop that, calm that friend down. And finally, the memory T cells, the smart kids, the quiet kids of the group that are like, uh uh, you need to remember what this whole process was. Let me do that for you. And this just helps me like really clearly remember it. Um, so hopefully this helped you. But if you want to find another way to remember it, sure do. I mean, the names are quite easy to sort of remember too, like helper, cytotoxic suppressor, memory. That works as well, but whatever works best for you there. So just remember, the two B cells are playing a huge role in the antibody-mediated immunity or humoral immunity, and the T cells play a big role in the cell-mediated immunity. Um, I just like to remember b cells as uh antibody mediated immunity like they're responsible for the antibody mediated immunity i uh, think about b cells and antibody like that can help 
body and B cells. Um, and that's how I remember that the opposite is the cell mediated. So antibody mediated is going to be humoral. The other one with the T cells is going to be cell mediated. That is something that helps me remember it. Okay. So now let us actually have a look at what this whole process is. What is happening here? Um, and to do that, what I might... Uh, give me one sec. Okay. I'm just going to go one step ahead. Uh, just because uh, I'm going to explain this first and then go back. So what is happening now? Let's have a... Uh, actually, no. Sorry. I'm going to talk about antigens and antibody first because I've mentioned it, but I haven't quite explained it properly to you yet. And we haven't seen sort of what's happening schematically. So let's do that first. So now we know that there are two important parts of the immune response. There is the cell mediated hum immunity and there is the humoral immunity. Um, so what happens is, firstly, we've got the antigen-antibody interactions. Like I said, the antigens, um, as you can see, are these receptors on the cell surface of the pathogen. So that is an antigen, and, and it has those, um, as you can, let me change the color of my pen so like I can actually use it. Um, oops. green so as you can see it has this uh this triangle you know this these shapes here right so it's got those shapes that's the antigen now it those shapes there those um and then that those are the antigens that are found on the surface of the cell then we've got the antibodies and there are three types of antibodies that you can see here each for a different type of antigen um space they all have different antigen binding sites and this is the this is the antigen binding site as you can see and they're all different for the different types of um for the different types of antigen and this process is called the colonial selection so the process by which um the the presence of a certain antigen selects immune cells that are specific to it so the antigen so the antibody that is selected for the antigen is going to be specific to the antigen and this process gives us the um, uh, the adaptive uh, the adaptive immunity response that is specific to the uh, to the pathogen, and so and this is like evolution, but for B and T cells. So what happens is that um, we've got the antigen molecules. These are these are the antigen molecules, and the B cells that differ in antigen specificity. They all have different shapes, as you can see here. This one has triangle. This one has uh, like triangle poking upwards. This is like a V shape here, and this one is like a U shape so they're all different antigen receptors and what happens is sorry these are all different antibodies sorry um, and what happens is when they um, when it sees the antigen it tries to match up it tries to match up and find the perfect match for whatever the antigen molecule is and whichever one fits so in this case this specific one fit to the antigen and so then this cell will replicate the plasma b cells will make lots of copies of the antibodies and those antibodies um will go ahead and um they will stick to that pathogen and what also happens is that um we get lots of clones of the memory cell so that in our body later these memory cells can circulate in case we get a reinfection they can quickly um, go ahead and deal with it. Um, and the clone of the plasma cells, these plasma cells produce the antibodies, which then come off the plasma cells, and they go ahead and latch onto the antigens wherever they find the antigens in the body. So what happens now is, I'm going to go one step ahead. What happens, um, actually, no, no, this is, actually, it would make more sense to go this way, sorry. I'm, like, skipping ahead in my own mind, so just give, so we'll go through this first. So, this is the process now, um, where I introduce you to a concept called the major histocompatibility complex. So, every single, so every single cell, um, so, basically, on, present on every single cell surface, um, it's specifically reserved for the presentation of molecules such as antigens and um, identification. So there's a 
histocompatibility complex that is found on the cell surface of every cell and it is used to either signal an antigen or for identification so you know so that your body is like able to distinguish between self and non-self cells so there is two types of histocompatibility complex the first one is present on all nucleated cells and it presents the normal proteins um, it makes and the abnormal ones. So what that means is these are the normal cells. It shows the immune cells that, okay, these are the normal cells. MHC2 is only present on antigen presenting cells and those are known as the A. PC. So they're only present on the antigen presenting cells. And what happens is um, they present the abnormal pathogenic antigens. So you can see over here that we've got um, in all nucleated cells, this is MH class 1, we've got the antigen binding cleft, and this is the beta 2 microglobulin. So it is part of the body, so it latches onto here. This is for all nucleated cells. But in MH C class 2 there's our antigen binding cleft right but um, here we've got the uh, the antigen itself so beta 1 beta 2 alpha 1 and alpha 2 so what does the major histocompatibility complex do now I'm gonna take you for a second into the world of my favorite books if you're not very familiar with it I will try my very best to explain it but hopefully um, most of us would know what's going on so we've got death heaters the death heaters are looking out um, in the prisoner of Azkaban in book three they are looking out for Voldemort right so they are looking out for um, for Voldemort and as a result of that they you know they're going to stay away from the students but they're looking out for anyone who resembles Voldemort and as a result of that everyone else has to be careful not to be like near Death Eaters because once they get to a person like they can suck the person's soul out that is the whole point of a Death Eater um a Death Eaters kiss and also I want you to imagine now that the Death Eater, in this case, is a cytotoxic killer T cell and the natural killer cells. Like I explained to you earlier, the cytotoxic killer T cells is that destructive cell in the group, that angry young cell, um, which is very hot-headed. And this cell, what it's going to do is it is going to be on the lookout for antigens. If it sees an antigen on a cell surface, it is going to go ahead and kill that cell off so that it can kill the antigen. So it's like a death heater in the body that is going everywhere and like, you know, look on the lookout for a death heater. Sorry, and on the lookout for an antigen. And it's very dangerous. Like if it comes near a cell, if it comes near a cell, just like death heaters, right? If it comes near a cell, like it can kill any cell essentially, but it is specifically looking for those cells with the antigens on it that um, that are foreign to the body. Any healthy cell does not want to be killed by a death eater is afraid of the death eater, is afraid of the cytotoxic killer cells as Harry is, right? So, so let's say that healthy cells are represented through Harry and that expecto patronum, that patronus is a normal pro, is the MHC, uh, is a normal, uh, is the cell showing the normal proteins that are being produced on the MHC1 to actually show the hay I am not the kill. I am not the antigen presenting. So I'm not the one. I'm not the you know the pathogen. Please let me go. That is what is happening here. So let me go through it again. The death eater is the cytotoxic killer cell and um, general natural killer cells. They are on the lookout for uh, antigens. Any normal cell, like they can go to any normal cell and they can kill it, but they won't because they're lo on the lookout of an antigen. That is the whole process of it. So that is why that healthy cell is going to show the normal proteins that it makes on its MHC class 1 to show the, the death heaters, to show the cytotoxic killer cells that, hey, I am a normal cell, let me go. That is what is happening. Harry does it. Harry produces a Patronus to show, to drive the death heaters away and in this case the patronus is the normal proteins that are being used once the cytotoxic t cells notice that hey it's the normal proteins this is not the antigen containing cell they go away 
So that's what the role of the major histocompatibility complex is. This is the analogy to help you understand it. So let us now focus on the big idea of what is actually happening. So I've talked about what happens in the cells. I have talked about um, basically, uh, you know, um, I've talked about what is happening. I have talked about the big idea of the individual cells. Now let us look at um, what happens as a whole. So let me walk you through this process. I'm going to make sure that my annotations are not messy, that you can read this. So let me walk you through this process and follow along with me. Um, these slides are here for you. If you want to go ahead later and like write down step by step what happens, that would be really helpful, I believe. So we've got a pathogen, right? That's our pathogen. And this is the antigen. The antigen that is being presented on its surface. Every cell will present an antigen on the surface. Normal cells present like the proteins they make to show that they are self cells right like our normal cells will show our immune systems that hey we belong to this body by showing us the proteins on the mhc class one with pathogens they are going to show the antigens so once the body sees this what happens is these pathogens are immediately engulfed by macrophages and macrophages um i cannot read that but i believe that is they have the mhc Hmm. So they're able to see what the antigen is here, basically. So these macrophages go ahead and um, the, they engulf the pathogen like the macrophages do. Then once they engulf the pathogen, they present the uh, antigens on their surface. So this is where now, this is the MHC class 2 presenters, basically. These are the MHC 2 class 2 presenters. So what happens is they eat the pathogen up and then they present the antigens on their surface. Right there. And then interleukins, um, which are like, proteins in the body they call help with t-cells and b-cells to the site of infect uh, to the site of infections then our macrophages they present these antigens here and basically we've got antibody mediated immunity here and cell body mediated immunity here and what happens is let me change my ink color and what happens is with the help of T cells, so they've got the T cell receptors here um, and they latch on to the antigen here and same thing happens with the B cells. The B cell will then differentiate into plasma cells and the and memory B cells. The memory B cells are going to store, uh, they're going to be stored in the lymph nodes and the next time that this pathogen comes back, they're going to be circulating and immediately jump to action. With our uh, plasma b cells they so this uh, antibody fits the macrophage over here um, remember this is why it takes time in that first process for the body to find the right antibody for the antigen the process is slow because we're trying to find out which antibody because we have lots of antibodies we are trying to find out which one fits the antigen that is on the surface so essentially once it differentiates um, the plasma cell clones and they let go and they secrete all of these antibodies these antibodies then go ahead and immobilize these pathogens they go to the pathogen and latch onto the pathogen and what this whole process does is now the, the fact that the antibodies have latched onto the antigen the body knows that it's flagged to the body that these guys are foreign invaders we don't want them that is why this whole process happens because we need to know what that antigen is that we're trying to kill and so these antibodies latch on to those antigens so and once that happens <laughs> A help uh, a T cells come into play. So help a T cell has gone ahead, um, got the antibody, right? And then it has uh, taken the antibody. It is stored in the memory B cells. These are the smart guys like the memory B cells here. And they remember that the next time that we see this antibody and uh, this antigen again, this is the antibody that works. We also have, um, we also see the helper T cells send out cytokines, like I said. And those cytokines call the uh 
killer T cells and suppressor T cells. The killer T cells comes and kills the, uh, the pathogen that has the antibody attached to it, right? And it secretes perforin, which is a toxic, uh, a toxic substance to kill, to destroy the pathogen. And what happens is our suppressor T cell comes along as well because it is the killer T cell's best friend. And it comes along and it suppresses the killer T cells, tells it to calm down once we have finished the immune response once we have destroyed the pathogen because remember it can't keep the immune response going otherwise that becomes destructive the killer t-cells can essentially kill all the cells um and they can affect all the cells and we have obviously seen autoimmune diseases where the body doesn't recognize the um self cells as self and they go ahead and um destroy those cells and don't let them function the regulation is all messed up so that can happen that is why we see these cells working together and the suppressor t cells and the suppressor t-cell suppressing and regulating the activity of the killer t-cell so this whole process starts off with the pathogen with the antigen the macrophages come these are all special white blood cells they come they display the antigen on the mhc wait let me write that down mhc2 receptors because there's an antigen presenting um right there these yellow thingies right and then after that they call they go ahead and they call the helper t cells and b cells and once these cells come they make these antibodies that can then go ahead and latch on to all the antigens all the all the pathogens you know the pathogen has replicated by now so go ahead latch on to the pathogen and deal with it that is the whole process. So I hope this was understandable. Um, and definitely I would suggest going ahead and watching um, some YouTube videos because they really helped me understand the whole process. Um, Amoeba Sisters is a good channel. They make um, YouTube videos, which is like generally at our you know, HSC level. Um, also Crash Course, of course, and uh, they make awesome videos as well. Like the visualization is really good in both of those um, videos. And and if they if there are any other good ones that you can find out there that don't go into too much detail but like this is the kind of detail you need to know <laughs> moving on now if you have any questions about that process please 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 feel free to ask so now we look at that last big dot point of prevention treatment and control the inquiry question here is how can the spread of infectious diseases be controlled so we have now seen firstly what those things are that cause the disease then we've talked about diseases in plants and animals and we've talked about specifically the human immune system and now we talk about um the now we talk about how we actually go ahead and control these diseases so there are three levels at which we need to prevent and control a disease. The first one is local, right? So think about the small scale things that we can do that we have experienced day to day. There's immunization, herd immunity, right? So during the, and I'll be using COVID-19 as a huge example here. <coughs> but sorry, so we've got herd immunity. So during COVID-19, you would have heard that term a lot. Um, no pun intended so you would have heard that term a lot um especially like uh in britain where they were really aiming to do to like achieve herd immunity obviously it didn't end up working out um <coughs> but that is something that they aim for so that's the herd immunity then personal hygiene so things like washing hands covering coughs cleaning surface um We've got self health practice, safe health practices, sorry. So, like staying home when you are sick, using contraceptives, and finally, public health and information. So, this is about, um, this is about creating awareness in society. So, that's that. Then, we've got regional, um, state and so. On a regional level, we are looking at a state and a country level. What are we doing to sp uh, to stop the spread of the infection? Again, um, monitoring environmental consider like sanitation facilities, um, food and water supplies, combating climate. So with uh, things like, for example, uh, again with malaria, for example, right? A huge, huge issue in um, in in Africa, in Southeast Asia. Uh, a huge uh, a huge condition that is affecting a lot of people and so with something like that like monitoring environmental consider uh, or conditions like you know trying to um, dr uh, uh, drain out swamps is a big 
a big strategy that um, a lot of these areas apply in order to stop the infection of uh, to stop the spread of malaria because that's that is the environment in which mosquitoes thrive and that um, uh, and the disease is spread it so there's monitoring environmental considers uh, consi uh, conditions um, improving swift educate uh, swift identifications of surveillance recognition and diagnosis this again we saw with COVID-19 there were um, test areas set up everywhere there were um, you know like areas specific areas were being um, surveyed uh, were, were being um, yeah were being surveyed and you know surveillance sorry um, also like something that this started to do towards the end of the not the end but like mid towards the end of the pandemic was when they started to uh, test the sewage water of specific areas in order to identify where like which buildings or which areas had infections um so that was another thing that would that they were doing and generally creating appropriate responses global is when we're now looking at a biggest that you know generally the biggest scale and we're firstly looking at quarantine so isolating banning individuals from traveling so as you would know travel basically shut down you know in 2020 as a result of this in most countries um communication so communication is done through reputable sources uh or like world health organization and monitoring um affected and potentially affected individuals like travel cards documents um documents used to track this data for example if you would um you would see that during the time that um there was ebola in like 2016 uh it, it was a huge uh, obviously a huge epidemic at the time and what they did was they um if you traveled to africa like and you were coming back they would ask you um and at the airport anyone who was coming into australia they would be asked whether or not you traveled to Africa like in the past week or something I can't remember how long it was but it definitely like they would definitely ask you whether or not you've traveled to that part of the world because of the fact that you may potentially be um, carrying the disease um, prevention and control obviously hygiene practices play a huge role quarantining vaccination public health programs pesticides and genetic engineering so um, Genetic engineering, novel, yay, uh, engineer, engineering resistance to pathogens like plants, animals, vectors, humans. Um, you would see that there has been some uh, scientific research and um, development surrounding like having mosquitoes, like engineering mosquitoes that don't have, like a, that that can not have or, or rather that yeah that are susceptible that are resistant to the plasmodium par uh, protozoa and they have like red eyes there has been there had been some research into it recently i can't remember um when that was but there was research into it um and there's research gen research generally into like stopping mosquitoes from carrying the plasmodium virus there has been scientific research into that too so engineering mosquitoes um and gene drives so push inheritance of modified gene in natural population so vaccination attenuated dead um so you can see the graph attenuated dead or synthetic viral uh, particle introduced to trigger a primary response so through this the antibody concentration um as you can see after the first vaccine so first vaccine on infection infection happens here the primary response the first time around the whole immune system response happens we get this is the antibody concentration happens over 40 days the sec sorry happens over like 20 25 days the second time that you get it the response you can see the slope here is so steep like it, the response is rapid and the antibody concentration is so huge the next time so vaccines play a huge role in that um and we've seen in the pandemic that again they've played a significant role in um reducing the uh, severity of the infections and also preventing infection <laughs> Okay, now let's have a look at um, prevention and control and not focusing on antibiotics and antivirals. So antibiotics are medications which inhibit bacterial cell processes to stop that the growth of the bacteria or kill the pathogen. And what they do is these um, interfere with cell wall synthesis, they interfere with nucleic acid synthesis, protein synthesis, and um, cell membrane permeability. And they their effectiveness um, is, their effectiveness is, depends obviously on the antibiotic and also the disease but we have seen antibiotic resistance become a um a big issue recently and the same thing happened with the uh, antibiotics for the um 
for malaria as well like people that the uh not people the the pathogen has become resistant to it so with antibiotic resistance the development of bacterial strains which do not respond uh to use of antibiotics like there is bacterial strains that then adapt to the antibiotic and stop responding to it that is what happened with malaria and this arises due to a misuse and overuse of antibiotics so you would see that if you ever have like a sore throat or a cough or whatever um you would not be given an antibiotic until unless it gets like really bad so that is an example of that antivirals these are medication um used to treat viral infection so remember based on the viral life cycle they block entry into the cell um they block viral synthesis by inhibiting transcription and they block um release of viruses so effectiveness well they are difficult to manufacture m molecules which block viruses without uh, without disrupting normal cell function there is rapid viral evolution there is of course antiviral re resistance and these are very expensive <laughs> So when we look at prevention and control, we want to think about um, incidence, prevalence and mortality, three important terms. So incidence is the frequency of new cases over a specified period of time. So with COVID-19, the incidence was, you know, number of new cases every week and every day. Um, prevalence is the population of, is the, pro uh, sorry, proportion of a particular population affected by a disease. So the prevalence of COVID-19 would be everyone who's had the disease has had COVID-19 um, over, you know, ever since like the beginning of the pandemic for example and mortality is the number of deaths within a particular population as a result of it so COVID-19 mortalities um, differ worldwide but you know we look at COVID-19 mortalities worldwide globally we look at it nationally and also based on like different states as well um, here is uh, some info on the historical sort of um, on yeah on the historical pathway of looking at um, infectious diseases and information surrounding infectious diseases so we start off with Hippocrates the um, very very famous you know known as the sort of the the god of um, modern science so Hippocrates proposes primitive form of epidemiology noting noting diseases only occur in certain places because of local conditions and then that is then um, obviously <laughs> developed upon from the 460 BCE all the way to 1965 when the World Health Organization implements the first global epidemiolo epidemiological surveillance unit to predict and track the spread of, communi of communicable diseases globally. And this is just, um, this obviously table does not go into a lot of detail. Uh, I would definitely recommend for you to research a bit more, um, but it gives you a good idea of, you know, that development over time and you can definitely add on. There's so much more going on, you can add on to it. Currently, in terms of uh, surveillance, there's event-based event surveillance and reporting by healthcare professional, news reports, social media, the global public health intelligence, uh, intelligence network, and um, they aim to provide real-time data on local disease activity. Web-based, of course, we have got um, lots of resources online that allow us to track uh, to track diseases with um, our world in data for example is a really good website that does that and there was also one that became really famous that was um, I guess programmed by a high school student um, that showed the worldwide statistics for COVID-19. Modeling is used to predict how infectious infectious diseases may spread um we saw a lot of this in COVID-19 where you know they actually showed models on what would happen if you know vaccinations weren't rolled out in a way or what would happen if you know masks weren't made mandatory so we've seen a lot of that um prevent looking now at bush medicine so bush medicine uh considers uh traditional skills and practices which were used by the indigenous australians to maintain their level of health and um they use native flora and fauna um and also preventative and diagnostic treatments in order to treat diseases and they also um focused on the treatment of mental illnesses so considering a holistic view of health is important and appreciating the cultural knowledge and traditional uh, and you know traditional knowledge systems that have existed long before modern medicine has come in is also very important so national aboriginal health strategy is not just physical well-being of the individual um so they have sorry outlined it's not just the physical well-being of the individual but the social emotional and cultural well-being of the whole community this is the whole of life view and it also includes the cyclical concept of life death life
Indigenous Australian communities are diverse and distinct, which means that you know, bush medicine is a collective term, but there's no single set of Aboriginal medicines and remedies. It is a huge collection of um, remedies and treatments. So finally, prevention and control, looking at, um, firstly, uh, a patent um, and patent is being used patents are obviously used you know when for example the vaccine um, formula and stuff that has been patented uh, different com companies have patented their different um, you know molecule or like the different processes um, but generally your patent is a legally enforceable right for a device substance method or process so IP Australia and why do we have them because it means exclusivity and so you know your intellectual property cannot be copied um and so ip and indigenous culture how does that play into uh bush medicine and the indig and indigenous medicine as we've talked about ip rights they give people the right to use their property as they choose the good thing here is that it's helping people to profit from the ideas so if someone else uses your idea they have to pay you for it um, bad is that it leads to a creation of monopolies and increasing price of important creation so this happens a lot in the pharmaceutical industry where um they patent specific drugs and you know antivirals and stuff um and they make money from that patent because no one else can produce that only they can produce uh you know those popular drugs um and there was even uh an example of a specific uh drug that was um patented by a big medical a big pharma company and really really successful and what happened is after it's patent expired i think after like four years they changed a molecule or something in the drug and then applied for a patent again and they got it and like and they made lots of money from it so it's it's a huge it's a huge thing um and you know when when we talk about uh patent it does not necessarily al align with the indigenous concept of ownership so the chain of connection isn't acknowledged indigenous australians have nurtured and protected flora and fauna for 65,000 plus years and so it is an important contribution um, that they have given to science and um, you know medicine a case study is the uh, smoke bush in Western Australia it is traditionally used um, and nurtured by indigenous Australians for medicine the US Department of Health and Human Services filed for a patent for its exclusive rights over active molecule in smoke bush however and that means that um, they actually got that patent so the US government the Western Australian government and also a pharmaceutical company they all profit from this patent but the um, the traditional owners who have you know used it and nurtured it um, do not get any recognition and that is of course problematic um, all right so let's finish off with some tips uh, exam tips and study I'll try to be quick uh, so practice papers first 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 uh, my key thing is do practice papers do practice questions they can be um, you know if you're running out of time I personally put the two together so if I felt like there were notes that I needed to make I would make that notes to a practice question so if one of them like example is that um, example for like a named plant so i wanted to consolidate my notes i got a question which was like name an australian plan whatever and then i just wrote like my notes to it and developed an answer to it um use others answers to narrow down your answers if you aren't you, you answers that you aren't sure about start memorizing your answers during the um multiple choice during reading time like try to remember them as you're reading through it um and of course ladies you can use those manicured nails to your advantage you have that one advantage and of course if you've got long long nails in general manicured or not you can just still use them um to like mark the answer with your nails um I mean, yeah, I don't think it personally worked for me because it would take me like a solid 10 minutes to see what I'm marked at. Uh, um, so I'd be like squinting at my paper. But, you know, obviously you can remember it too. General tips, equip yourselves with examples. Examples are the key in biology. Mark allocations are super important as well. So the level of they let you know what the level of detail you want to go in. The structure extended response, the structure extended responses. So for your eight, nine, ten, even six, seven markers, structure is important. You want to guide your marker through your writing. You don't want to just, you know, regurgitate everything on the paper. You need to make your arguments clearly. So um, there's nothing worse than making an examiner <laughs> wade through a pile of alphabetic 
soup. So structure, think of it as a mini essay. Finally, get used to the HSE web. So you need to find your own little niche to answer the questions. So you know, how would you go about answering a compare question versus a draw table? Uh, sorry, versus like, you know, a, juxtap a juxtapose, no, not juxtapose, that's compare, ju uh, justify question. Short answer responses, once grade or equal to four marks is when you start using paragraph. Um, get used to generic questions like to describe that, uh, outline this feature, assess this feature. Um, definition plus example plus explanation is generally three marks. If it's a three marker, you want to include all three elements. Do not be afraid to draw diagrams. I think it's not very conventional, but you can definitely draw them as long as you... Um, you know, as long as you talk about it in your response as well. So roughly use one to two lines for every mark, but you can write more, like you're not restricted. Uh, along with that, you make sure that you know the verbs. Your articula your articulation needs to be good. You need to give me a point and then explain that point, And that comes through with practice and use as many biological terms as you can. Extended responses, structure, like I said, examples, a long response should be one, two, two and a half pages long almost and legitimate, uh, sorry, and legibility. So legibility is important. So that it comes back to writing. If you are like not write, handwriting your answers, um, you're almost disadvantaging yourself because that is what you have to do in the HSC. So handwrite your answers. So general structure could be, you know, having an intro, having a, um, obviously a three paragraphs, third one can be optional and then a conclusion to some it up okay that is all from me today thank you so much for coming and i hope today um all the content we went through today made sense um please again ask any questions that you've got hopefully i've answered them um as we go take this time for before the exam to figure out what works for you you know put yourself um in place for success you know put good, ha good habits in place and i'm sure you guys will smash it so thank you so much for tuning in today it was lovely you know, knowing that you guys are, sorry, let me just discard those because those annotations, um, not my best work, but it was lovely knowing that, you know, we are connected through the screen and um, I wish you all the very, very best as you go ahead and conquer this term, the next term and the HSC. So thank you.